Welcome to Physics Office Hours. My name is Eric. In this video, we're going to talk about the condo problem. This is a final project for my class that I took this spring at Binghamton University, Advanced Condensed Matter. The project was basically to write a two-page paper and give a 10 to 15 minute presentation uh, on, the, on any topic of my choosing. I did in fact choose the condo problem. In this video, I go over a brief history and summary of what the condo problem is and how it was solved. I did do this live, and if you would like to check out my Twitch stream sometime, all the information for that is down in the description below. Uh, make sure you subscribe to this channel if you'd like to see some of the VODs from that, as well as occasionally some original content. I do have one regret with this video, and that is that I didn't speak enough about Phil Anderson and his contributions with the Anderson impurities and how that played a giant role in the condo problem. But nevertheless, I hope you enjoy the video. Please let me know if you do down in the comment section below. I'll see you there, or I'll see you over on Twitch. Take care. Here we are. So today I'm going to talk about the condo effect and its applications. This is my presentation for my final project in Advanced Condensed Matter in the spring of 2021. First, a little history about the topic. Uh, the phenomenon was first observed in the Owens Laboratory in 1934 uh, by Haas, Bohr, and Vandenberg, who discovered that the resistance curve of impure gold has a minimum at low temperatures. It was very strange because they thought that the resistivity curves were going to follow what was known as the Matheson equation, which stated basically that as the lower the temperature got, so does the resistivity. You'll notice here by this, by this equation here that as temperature goes down, there might be some form of resistivity that's residual or that's... Um, yeah, this residual based on some impurities, I should have been more specific, the resistivity of a metallic alloy or a, a metal with a, uh, a impurity in the lattice, that there might be some residual uh, resistivity left, but the, the, the pure ideal resistivity would follow a temperature curve that as the temperature goes to zero, so will this ideal resistivity. Uh, but this phenomenon, uh, and th but this phenomenon was strange because it did not actually do that. It had a minimum. It would drop to a certain temperature and then begin to rise again, and eventually it would plateau out. Uh, this, um, this, uh, <clears throat> this phenomenon was linked to impurities in metal. Like I said, in metallic alloys, but most more specifically, it was linked to specifically magnetic impurities. Uh, and then this kind of drove people crazy for a long time, and it wouldn't be until about 30 years later that June Kondo would show, using perturbative methods, that the resistivity would rise due to the uncertainty principle and the spins associated with conducting electrons, which we will talk about very shortly. Uh, so Kondo had some motivations for wanting to do this work. Uh, he knew that these two things resulted in a very important... Uh, resulted in a very important uh, conclusion. Uh, the two experimental observations he had were that firstly, that there was a temperature that was minimum, a minimum temperature, and uh, before it would begin to rise. And secondly, that the, the minimum depth of the temperature seemed to have a very specific relationship. Uh, it, was, it was very, um, it was related to the minimum resi resistivity and what the resist resistivity should be at T equals zero or absolute zero. Uh, and these two observations led Kondo to believe that the problem had to do with adding spins perturbatively as opposed to deriving correlations between uh, spin conditions, like localized spin conditions. Uh, so this is what Kondo was able to show. This is kind of the, the crux of the argument, the, 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 the really cool thing that he was able to show. Uh, if there's an impurity in the lattice, then the energy level of an electron on the impurity is less than the than that of the Fermi C. That was already known. And as you can see in this picture, we have in the middle, we have some impurity. On the either side of this impurity is a potential wall. And then on either side of that, over here we have a Fermi C. And over here we have the other Fermi C. These are representative of different electron orbitals. So this would be the S and this would be the D orbital. Now, the idea was that at low enough temperatures, you could actually have this electron, or this, yeah, an electron that's on this impurity tunnel through this potential barrier and make its way to a, the fair, uh, a hole on the Fermi C. 
so long as, this is where the uncertainty principle came into play, so long as one of these electrons that was on this side in this Fermi C were to take its place in a sufficient amount of time. Of course, we have that uncertainty relationship where you have delta E delta T is greater than or equal to uh, H bar over 2. This is the uncertainty relationship that we're talking about here. Now, what would end up happening uh, is that the, the, the very interesting thing is that this, this electron that was here that would tunnel through the wall would be replaced by an electron in the s orbital. <clears throat> the electron that replaced or that went into the hole did not have to have the same spin. Notice how in this, this is one of the many options that are available for this interaction to happen, uh, uh, where we have the electron hop through the wall. Uh, and then get replaced. This this is one of the interactions where the electron has the opposite spin. Uh, so there's a little bit interesting things about that because the scattering process for the spin exchange has actually a higher probability of taking place than that of the spin preserving interaction, which I think this is one of the very unusual things that was being discovered at the time. It was actually twice as high that a spin exchanging interaction were to take place than a spin preserving interaction. Uh, and Kondo was actually able to use this and talk about the... Uh, the Fermi distribution level and how it impacted the uh, the Fermi C, and it would it would change it in a way so that the resistivity uh, could be mapped uh, in this way proportional to this function here, and basically logarithmic in T. Uh, and this is an interesting consequence because two things happen here. One, this if you wanted to get data that matched the the situation, this J, which is an experimentally confirmed coupling constant, basically determines the strength of, of these interactions that are happening. This J would actually have to be negative, which has all sorts of in, in it has all sorts of, of uh, complicated details that go with that. But also, namely, that there would be a singularity at t equals zero, which is of course not what we wanted to have. Uh, and this was the problem that was famously dubbed the condo problem that would be solved about a decade later by Wilson uh, and his renormalization theory. Uh, and I think I have the link to that uh, in, in, in my, uh, yes, yeah, right here, the normalization group, critical phenomenon and the condo problem. Uh, and that was this paper that he was, he was uh, able to show where the condo problem was solved basically by electron shielding at higher levels of perturbation. And, uh, and and basically introducing quasi-particles on this, the Fermi surface. Um, so where is this used nowadays? Well, because of all of the work that was done by Wilson and Kondo, this became well understood in metallic alloys. Uh, a lot of um, the original uh, graph I have right here, which shows how temperature and resistivity are changing, uh, it, it shows that in uh, gold with some iron uh, as the imperfections or the impurities placed inside the lattice. And you can see here how as you reach to a certain temperature, then the resistivity would start to rise. As you change some of the parameters, these different uh, these different graphs indicate the different parameters that the, as they're changing. Uh, as you change the parameters, basically the density of the impurities um, and other ways of, of growing the uh, growing the lattice, like uh, for the experiment, uh, then it would change the curve itself. But regardless of how it changed, every one of these shows that after you get to a certain temperature, there is a rise in that resistivity. And uh, so it was well understood. Oh, where am I? Oh, wrong way. Here we go. Um, so it was well understood in metallic alloys. Uh, and, and this was mainly done by Wilson and Kondo and then those who followed using those works. But now, in, the, in 1998, with the, um, the technology that has become more prominent is quantum dots. Now, a quantum dot is done by capturing a two-dimensional gas inside of a negative potential well. And the way that we use it for the Kondo, uh, the Kondo effect is you can actually lower that potential well until it's low enough that the, the electrons are able to tunnel. So again, you'll have a situation like this where you'll have the electrons isolated in the quantum dot and then you lower the potential well enough such that this electron can make the tunnel through this potential barrier. Uh, and the nice thing about this is that uh, th these are very controlled experiments, right? Like you can control the electrons inside that two-dimensional gas by changing the way that the, uh, the uh, electric field, magnetic fields runs over it. You can adjust the spins of the electrons. You can kind of control all of the, all of the parameters that went into these quantum dots. 
which makes the precision of these quantum tunneling effects very, very particular and very uh, accurate. Uh, so now, I think 1964 was just an exciting year. Uh, some of the other things that were going on at that time was the unveiling of the quarks by Gell-Mann. Uh, the Bell experiment was really uh, taking off and like showing di uh, how Bell's theorem actually worked, which I think Bell's theorem came out that year. Uh, Somewhere around there. And the chem and then, of course, Kondo's paper. Uh, and there was many more things that were happening in 1964. So it was a very exciting uh, year. And Kondo solving uh, this uh, uh, particular um, phenomenon, as well as introducing some more problems that became you know, uh, became solved a decade later, was a huge year. Uh, but more importantly about nowadays, uh, I think this is the exciting time for condo physics and the condo effect in solid state physics. We have the ability to control electrons tunneling through quantum dots, um, through the potential walls of the quantum dots. And that really is helpful for a lot of things. There's two two name one, main ones that I want to talk about. One is the Myron of fermions. Uh, Myron of fermions work as uh, topological quantum qubits because the only information that's shared between the two is basically any order, any way that you might um, you might permute them around a uh, quantum or around edge states. So you can actually take an electron's wave function, you can split it into two edge states, and then if you were to uh, permute those edge states around, uh, then you would get one um, one piece of, of information, uh, and then if you were to put it around the other way, you'd get another. And the only type of information that that has. Um, stored in itself is which way you took those two edge states, those two Majorana of fermions, and moved them around each other. Uh, and that's really helpful in quantum computing because it, it cuts down uh, tremendously on decoherence. So these, uh, the, the ability to take these Majorana of fermions and uh, permute them around has a lot to do with this condo problem and the effects of that. And that, there's, so there's a lot of work on that. So the Majorana fermion, which is kind of like this unicorn right now in, in, in quantum computing, uh, it, it, it is utilizing a lot of the the, um, the advancements that were made through the quant, uh, Kondo effect. And also quantum criticality is another uh, of these of these uh, very complicated physics problems that it's taking advantage of the um, of the Kondo effect. Here are the references that I've used uh, towards. Um, they're not in any specific order, but uh, maybe a few ones to note would be the uh, the first one, which is on Majorana fermions. And uh, there's a couple on Majorana fermions. But anyways, there's a few of the references I used. Uh, and that's it. Thank you for coming to my talk. Uh, and have a good day.